Good morning. Good morning. Isn't it good to be in the house of the Lord today? Amen. I want you to uh, remember all of our sick folks today. We've got quite a few that are that are sick, and so our choir decided what few we have here today decided to join y'all out there today. And uh, so, just remember all of our sick people in your prayers. Will you stand with me as we sing our call to worship? There's something about that name, and we'll sing it through one time. Good to have each one of you with us this morning. We are certainly glad and thankful to be here today. We are uh, blessed to have uh, to have each one of you with us. And as I stated before, every Sunday is a, a wonderful day of, of celebration. It's not just about Easter Sunday or Christmas Sunday or any other such. Every Sunday is a time of celebration. And so for that, for that reason, we gather together and we lift up the name of Christ. And I know that everybody's got stuff going on in their life today. And uh, but this is. You know, we, we have an opportunity to just step away from it and identify the fact that God is good and that He's blessed us and we get to be here today. So, uh, so we're glad to have you. Let me make a couple of announcements real quick, then we'll take our prayer request. Uh, the choir will be practicing today at, four, at 5 o'clock today. Uh, we will have our worship service tonight at 6 o'clock right here in the sanctuary. And, and, and I said it before, all we generally do is we kind of do a little devotion. We have a time of prayer. And so if you'd like to come out and just join with us and kind of end your day in a time of prayer, then we'd love to have you. Uh, our uh, Easter program this year for the kids is going to be different than what we've done in the past. Over the past few years, we've done a spring fling. Uh, this year, it's going to be a little bit different. It's going to be have a, a, a Bible school set up to it to where we're actually going to spend a lot more time telling the story about the death and the resurrection of Jesus. And it'll be from 2 o'clock to 5 o'clock on... Uh, somebody help me. On March the 19th. Thank you, Tim. March the 19th from 2 o'clock to 5 o'clock. And we would love to have your kids come out and participate in that. If you'd like to volunteer, if you'll see Amy, she will uh, gladly take your help there. Uh, there's a couple of... Renee, you want to run over a couple of announcements real quick? I, I can't remember the... If you'll do the women's for me. All right. Thank you, Renee. And, uh, and like we said last Sunday, if you've not got a uh, newsletter, most of it's in there. Some of it's in the bulletin. So, uh, so get those out and check those out, please. Are there any other announcements of any kind before we take prayer requests this morning? Right, absolutely. <laughs> All right. There you go. 
Well, we are. We're certainly glad to have them. <laughs> yeah, the altar's open. Ready for repentance. <laughs> uh-huh. Uh-huh. Right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. <sighs> right. Right, sure do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You're right. <laughs> well, we're glad to have y'all with us. Sure are. Sure are. Uh, all right. Oh, well, congratulations. All right. Congratulations. Uh huh. Thanks. All right, what about prayer requests this morning? We are glad that Jan's back with us this morning. Yep. Okay. All right. Remember Madeline uh, when you pray. <clears throat> okay. Mike Kitchens. Yeah, his father passed away. Okay. Okay, Miss Loveless. Betty, okay. We are. We're glad that Grace is with us this morning. Okay. I'm sorry, Chris Brewer, is that what you said? Okay. All right. Okay. Okay. All right. Sure will. Okay. Right. Yeah. Mackenzie Perkins is her name. Okay. All right. Go ahead, Miss Sharp. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Amen. Amen. You know, we couldn't make it without prayer. No two ways around it. Continue to keep Amy's dad uh, in your prayers when you pray. He uh, has, uh, I want to say, eight more treatments. Isn't that right, Amy? I think he has eight more treatments. It'll finish up next Wednesday will be his last treatment. So uh, so continue to keep them. I'm sure they'll evaluate that once it's over with and see what to do next. But uh, just keep them and, and his family in your prayers when you pray. Okay. Traveling for Linda. Okay. Okay. All right. What about other unspoken? Is there other unspoken? God knows everything that's going on in our lives. Oh, okay. All right. All right. We know uh, the Lord knows everything that's going on in our lives. Uh, the big stuff, the little stuff, stuff that might be very public and stuff that's very private, uh, whatever it is. And so this morning, 
uh, we acknowledge that. You know, he said that if two of you are gathered in my name, that I'm in the midst. And so we, we believe that we're gathered here with him this morning. And so because of that, there comes a lot of wonderful opportunity and a lot of great strength for help in times of need. So this morning, we're going to turn that over to him and uh, lay the stuff down and, uh, and let him do with it as he sees fit. But before I do that, Amy wants to, you want to say something? Yeah, a couple things here real quick. Come on up here. You can use the mic here. One is a prayer request. My dearest friend from, Lord, I guess, Brandy and I have been friends probably since we were about three or four years old. She's in the hospital, and they can't exactly figure out what's going on with her, but her body is attacking itself, and they can't keep her platelet count up. And uh, I've been conversing back and forth with her parents, and she's in a pretty rough shape right now. Uh, she can't have visitors or anything like that. She's in ICU in Gadsden, and they... Um, this morning, the last update I had, they can't get her stable enough to even move her to another hospital. So if you will just pray for her, her name is Brandy Rawson, um, I would greatly appreciate it. And saying that, I know that you will because you have been praying for me and for my family over the last two or two and a half months. Um, it's been a very trying time, and without you, I don't think that I could have gotten through it. Uh, Daddy is pretty much about the same. He has his good days and his bad days. And, um, but it really has encouraged him. He gets lots of cards from this church. And uh, some of you, he remembers that he's met you before. Some of you, he can't. Uh, you know, he knows where you're from, but it just lights up his day. He just smiles from ear to ear. He can be so sad. And then we go to the mailbox and we get a card. And he always says, that's Amy's church. And he just smiles, and he's so thrilled to know that people are lifting him up. And I appreciate that. I appreciate the prayers that you've prayed, how that you have taken care of my family. When I've been gone, it's been hard to be away from the kids and from Kenny. And I know it's been hard on him. He's had to do triple the work trying to be here at the church and take care of the kids and the kids have been so puny since I've been away, and uh, so he's had sick ones he's had to take care of, and you all have been there for him. You have lifted him up, you've brought food, you have taken care of, helped us take care of the kids, and we couldn't do it without you. You're such a loving church, and you're not just our church or our family. And I just wanted to tell you this morning how much I appreciate all of that, all of your help financially. Without the way that you've helped us, I could not have traveled back and forth the way that I have over the last few weeks. And um, it has been such a precious time for me to be able to spend, even though that I'm taking care of my dad in a way that I never thought I would have to. But I feel the love and the prayer from this church that God is holding me up through doing some difficult things and I just want you to know how much I love you and I appreciate you being there for us. I have a card here from my stepmother and my daddy I wanted to read. It said thank you all so much for the prayers, all the get well cards and wishes. Your church means so much to me and to Johnny. May God bless each of you. You are such special people. Please continue to keep us in your prayers, Faye and Johnny McCain. Thank you. And we do. We certainly appreciate all your prayers and help uh, during this difficult time. And so many of you have been there. You know what it is. And you know the, the, the heaviness and the heartache that goes along with it. And so we thank you so much for uh, your support during this time. If you'll stand to your feet, bow your head. Let us go to the Lord with a word of prayer this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time together this morning. And we thank you, Father, for the love that you have for us, for the people that you've placed around us. And God, for all that you do for us each and every day, Lord, you have uh, proven to us time and time again before we could ever even understand that you loved us and that you're committed to us. And we give you thanks for that. Lord, we lift up those that are sick, those that need a touch. Father, we ask that your will will be accomplished in their lives and uh, that you would just surround them with people that care about them and people that love them and lift them up. And Lord, for those that are in caregiving situations, we ask for your strength in those, those ways as well. Lord, help us to be the church to those around us that are in need. Lord, those that we know about, and Lord, make us aware of situations of where we can help and let your love be seen. And we ask this morning 
that your spirit rests upon this service, that you just anoint it in a wonderful way. And God, that, that all that we do today will, be, uh, will glorify you. And we ask this in Christ's name. Amen. If you'll remain standing, we'll let Sandra lead us in worship this morning. Holy, holy, holy. of faith together this morning. Let us read. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. <coughs> Victory in Jesus.
first too early. <laughs> At this time, we'll ask our ushers to come down as we take up our morning offering. Bow your heads, let us pray. Father, we come to you once again this morning, and we thank you, Father, for who you are and for the love that you continue to bestow upon us. And Father, we thank you for abundantly supplying our every need. And God, we, uh, as we get to worship by giving this morning, we ask that you would take this, that you would use it for the building up of your kingdom. And once again, we thank you so much, for we know that every good gift comes from you. And we ask that your spirit lead to this church in the proper use of it. In Jesus' name, amen. have a seat. Welcome someone around you. Let them know you're glad they're here.
All right. <clears throat> Once again, it is good to have each one of you with us this morning. We are leading up to uh, our uh, March the 27th Easter Sunday morning. We, excuse me, we will be having sunrise service that morning at uh, where was Central Heights Baptist. That's right. <clears throat> Central Heights Baptist, and, uh, well, let's, well I, you know, who's speaking, Sheila? Do we know? Okay, yeah, Dr. Yates from Central Methodist is speaking, and it's, I, I'm, I'm going to say 6 o'clock. 6.30. It's in the bulletin. <laughs> Read your bulletin. Yeah, my mind's in diff- it's distracted, so, uh, uh, yeah, that's, uh, we will have a sunrise at Central Baptist Church at 6.30. So uh, all of you that can come out and be with us, we'd love to have you. If you decide to sleep in that morning, uh, I don't blame you. <laughs> I've, been, I've often wondered, you know, growing up in the preacher's pastor's home, we always had sunrise service, and it, just, it never made a lot. Of, I understand the premise behind it. But you talk about making a, a, an Easter Sunday hard. Yes, yeah, sunrise will do it. But anyway, come on out. We'd love to have you. You just come on out, and we'll all gather together and have a big time. But anyway, uh, uh, this morning we are going to continue. We've been st- started sermon series back uh, at the Sunday, actually, before Lent started. And the, the title of it's Invest. And just let me give you just a little quick synopsis here uh, before we get into the actual scripture this morning. The idea behind it is, I think it's very important, especially as we mature in the faith, to acknowledge the things and the ways of which God has poured into our life. Now, it's easy to step back and look physically at the things, maybe the worldly blessings that we count, or the food that we eat, the cars that we drive, the clothes on our back, which are not light things, but in the scope of things, there are bigger things. There's heavier things of which God has blessed us with and poured into our life than just worldly, tangible things. And, and over the past few Sundays, we've been talking about what some of those things are in the way of which God has done it, but not just how we have received it, maybe the ways of which God has influenced us or put people in our life to influence us, or the ways of which God has nurtured us or nourished us, or the way of which God validates us through Christ as we stand before Him. But it's also the idea of what we are to do for others as well. There comes a time and a point to where uh, you know, we become the vessel of which God uses to pour into somebody else's life. You know, there comes a time when we become the one that's asked to offer up some nourishment, or we become the one uh, that is asked to offer up influence for the sake of God's kingdom, or, or it, it, it's our turn uh, to be on the other side of it. And, and we can all think back over our life, and we can think of, uh, recall people who have had a tremendous influence of our life. If it's somebody we work with, or I told them or, uh, this morning at the early service that there was a, a Sunday school teacher, probably my first Sunday school teacher, after we got in church, and, and I began going to Sunday school. Her name was Sarah Dixon, and uh, Sarah was all my life. She'd been a Sunday school teacher, and I, I grew up with her, and, and it was the first place of where I become, I was introduced to these wonderful stories that's in the Bible. I mean, she was the first one to tell me these stories, and, uh, and they were remarkable. And, and she would tell it with excitement, and she would tell it with fervor. And, uh, and there, there was only four or five of us in the Sunday school room, and it was just at that stage where you're kind of starting to read, and she would let everybody read a little bit, and then she would talk about the stories, and, and she would tell it as if she was telling it to 400. I mean, she wouldn't hold anything back, and... It was in this little, uh, you know, cinder block room in the, this little fellowship hall, and it was kind of damp a little bit, and it, it wasn't, you know, what you would consider the most ideal situation, but she had a tremendous influence on my life because that was the first place of where these stories were. I was introduced to these stories. And looking back on it now, in the moment, I was just fascinated with the stories. But when I stand today as as someone who is maturing in the faith and has grown up and is working to put away childish things and reach to those things which are in front of us, I don't see just somebody telling me stories. I see a woman who was a vessel that God used to influence me and to pour into my life. And it wasn't an accident. She allowed that to happen. She willfully allowed to give herself to God so that God could use her as this remarkable vessel 
to influence and to nurture and to help me understand what it means to stand before God and just all these wonderful things. So there comes a time in our life when we are the ones receiving these things, but there's also got to come a time and place when we become the vessel that God uses to pour into the lives of the people around us. It doesn't have to be children that live at home with us. It can be coworkers, or it can be family members or friends or neighbors or whatever it might be, just the people that we come in contact with. And all it boils down to is just allowing ourselves to be a vessel that God uses to pour into the lives of the people around us. <clears throat> Today we're going to talk about empower and what that means. And, and the definition is fairly simple. I mean, this is Merriam-Webster's definition of empowers to give power or authority to to authorize, especially by legal or official means. And what we're going to talk about this morning is the way of which God has empowered the believers and, and how he's done that and why that's a necessity. So before we talk about the scripture and acts of, of, of why he's done it or how he did that, <clears throat> let's talk about the necessity or the need to be empowered before we do anything else. There is a, a, a condition that all of us live in today, this fallen condition uh, of, that creates the problems that we have today. Every one of us. It doesn't matter how young we are or how old we are. As long as we live in this world and as long as we're in this flesh, we are living in a broken, fallen condition. And so, in, and in the process of living in that, we try to figure out what it means to be a born-again believer and a new creature in Christ at the same time living in a fallen, broken state. And let's face it, it's complicated. It offers up a lot of trouble. It offers up a lot of issues, a lot of heartache. Our faith is declaring this. And, and in our world, we're watching this unfold. You know, our faith talks about peace. And our faith talks about uh, the way God settles storms that rage in our life. And at the same time, in our broken world, it seems like it's chaos on every corner. You know, and it's, every time you turn the news on, it's bad stuff. And, and, and it's just one troubled thing after another. If you allow yourself... You can lay awake at night thinking about all your problems, your neighbor's problems, your mama's and daddy's problems. You can think about everybody's problems if you want to because there's so much chaos it seems like we deal with. And at the same time, our faith cries peace and talks about the peace. So it, it creates this complicated, confusing condition at times because within me is a, is a born-again believer. Within me is a new creature in Christ. But that new creature in Christ that is renewed day by day through the power of the Spirit of God, it is housed in this broken flesh that has its struggles. It, it, it struggles to understand at times. It struggles to want things it shouldn't have. It, it struggles to do the right thing when it wants to do the wrong thing. It has these struggles, but it doesn't diminish the new creature in Christ that is working within me right now. And so that, that, that's where we're at. So what happens is, is that we depend on God through the power of the Spirit that gives us power over things that we've never had power over before. Through the work of the Spirit and the way of which God works in our life, it gives us, He gives us authority and He gives us power over things that we have been powerless to because that's why we're in our broken state today is because we've not had power over these things. Sin has reigned in our body. It's reigned in our creation. It has caused confusion. It has caused death. It has caused heartache. It has caused disappointments in our life. It has caused all of these things. And it doesn't matter how strong you are, or it doesn't matter how much you know, or what you think you've got figured out. Without the power of God, you are powerless against sin. You're powerless against sin. It doesn't matter. You can quote me scripture from Genesis to Revelation. Without being empowered through the work of the Spirit in your life, you are a prisoner of sin. And the reason is because it's bigger than you. It's stronger than you. The Bible, uh, Jesus describes Satan as a strong man that will come into your house and will occupy your house and keep everything under control. And then Jesus says the only way to get the strong man out is for a stronger man to come in and force him out. And he never, never describes us as a stronger, stronger man. And that's not the case because we're not. We're powerless in these areas. So what happened is after Christ died on the cross and uh, was resurrected on the third day and ascended into heaven, the Father promised uh, the Spirit. And so he sent the Spirit. And when the Father sent the Spirit down to empower the church, that's when they began to live and walk and become different people. 
And what the Spirit does, the Spirit of the Lord lets us, allows us to become people that we could never be on our own. And the, and the disciples are perfect examples of that. I mean, before the Spirit descends, Peter is one that runs away at trouble. He is indecisive at times. He is too decisive in some areas. I mean, he's, he's wishy and washy. He's wavering. He doesn't know if he should stand. He doesn't know if he should fight or he doesn't know if he should run away. Then after the Spirit descends, we find one who becomes a rock, steadfast, immovable in Christ. And it's not because Peter overcome his fear by himself. It's because the Spirit of God empowered him to be transformed in Christ. Let me tell you something. I, <clears throat> I got saved when I was nine years old and baptized. And during that journey, which I'm 41 today, and on this journey... Uh, I have watched a lot of transformation take place in my life. You know, and, and there for a time, I would say it's safe to say that I was confused about how that transformation took place. There for a long time, I felt like the weight of the transformation actually depended more on me than it did on God. And as I've gotten older, I've come to realize, especially looking back over my journey, that any transformation that's happened in my life has come from the power of the Spirit within me versus my own ability or my own simple determination. It's become more of the power of the Spirit and the perseverance of the Spirit and not my own. And so as we talk about this today and we talk about being empowered through the Spirit, we're not talking about what the world would consider as one to be empowered. We're talking about being empowered to overcome the stuff that's always had us and works today to try to keep us and keep us, uh, keep us in prison. So let me read some scripture to you real quick. And we're going to start with Acts chapter 1, verse 4 through 8. And this is the place of where the church was actually born at this particular time. This is where it becomes more than just a group of people. This is where, when it becomes more than just, more, uh, more than just a civil group or, or more than just a club of any sort. This is the place of where the church is empowered to do things that it's never been able to do. It says, and at the beginning, uh, it says, and being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father has put in his own authority. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And this is the place, like I said, where the church becomes the church. This is where it becomes more than two or three people gathered together who believe in Jesus. They, it, it's more than that. It is this collective group that within it, they are enabled, they are equipped, and they are empowered to go do the work of the Lord in this broken world. Now listen. I'm telling you, if you've walked with Christ very long and if you've tried to do any ministry in this world, let's, let's skip ministry. Let, let, let's just skip the idea of going to Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and unto the end of the earth. Let's just talk about in your own house. Let's just talk about that. When, when, when you try to clean up your own house, as you walk with Christ, you get all types of revelation about the things that's not right in your life. When you walk with Christ, you are you're shown the things that... Uh, maybe you value more than him. You are shown the ways that you get wrapped up into the world. You are shown issues of where you get too upset and you're too impatient and you're too judgmental and you get too angry at times. I'm talking about just cleaning up your own house. Let's forget about the power to stand in the midst of troubled, uh, in the midst of troubled countries or troubled homes and declare the name of Jesus. I just mean within your own house. You have got to have something more powerful than you just to address your own house, much less to be a witness to the world around us. You know, you, you watch people who try to live a Christian life without trusting and depending on the power of the Spirit. You know, I, I know I've told you all this story before, and I want to tell it again because it had, it, it had such an impact on me. It was a book that we were reading, one of our small old men's group here, and we were reading a book about, uh, he, was, he was talking about the things that men struggle with. And one of the chapters in it, he talks about the way 
men try to deal with sin or the way that the, the church oftentimes teaches people to deal with sin. And the guy that's writing it, he tells about how when he was younger, he loved to fight. And like I said, I know I've told you this, but he loved to fight. He said he would fight anytime anybody wanted to fight. He was, he was in for it, no matter what. And he said his biggest fan was his sister. He says his little sister. Every time he was willing to fight, his little sister there was to cheer him on the whole time. He said, well, one particular day, he got into a fight with a little boy that was uh, not so little, much bigger, much stronger, and and uh, it was just getting the absolute best of him and just tearing him up. And his little sister was off to the side over there, and she kept saying, don't quit, keep fighting, just keep fighting. You're gonna, don't, don't stop, you're going to win. You just keep fighting, keep fighting, keep fighting. He said, so I just kept fighting? He said, and I just kept getting whipped. And he said, and my little sister was there saying, well, you can't quit now. you got to keep fighting. He said, and so he just kept fighting and kept fighting, and the more he fought, the more he would get whipped by this bigger opponent that he was fighting and the analogy that I was making was unfortunately we often give that type of instructions to people who are fighting something bigger than themselves we often instruct them just don't stop fighting just keep fighting just keep fighting don't stop fighting you just keep fighting keep fighting and the point that he makes is is that the harsh reality is sin is so much bigger than us and it doesn't matter how much you determine to fight. Without the power of Christ, you cannot win that fight. You can't win that fight. So it's irresponsible of us to step back and to tell new believers or people who are going through hard times and struggling with brokenness that this world offers, you just, just, you just gotta, gotta fight. You gotta fight. There's a power that God gives the believer through His Spirit within them that equips them, enables them, and empowers them to overcome what they're dealing with. So when I step back and I look at the transformation that happened in my life, it was not because Kenny decided to keep fighting. It was because the power of Christ conquered these things in my life. And so as we make our way through this and we read this story about this is where the church was empowered to finally conquer what had been conquering it forever. This is where the church was empowered to finally become more than just broken vessels. So let me, let me go on and read the next passage to you real quick. Acts 4 and 13, here's what it said. Uh, this was the transformation that happened in Peter and John's life. It says, now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men, they marveled and they realized that they had been with Jesus. And listen, this is what Christ does. This is the power within uh, that we have through Christ, that it allows us to become more than we could ever be on our own. Listen, Peter was never one who was known up until this point for his boldness. I mean, he was known for his irrational behavior at times, and, and there's no doubt about it. He was, uh, uh, you know, quick-tempered at times, and at other times he was scared and would run away. But after he was empowered through the Spirit, we have different people now. What would it have been if they were gathered together there in that upper room that day? The Spirit of God descends, fills their heart, fills their life, and they all leave there exactly the same way as they were. It would have been a powerless experience, would it not? What would it have been if Peter would have left there still afraid of, of anybody that might claim that he is a follower of Jesus? What would it have been if that group of believers would have got together that day and they would have dispersed that day, everybody still afraid, everybody still giving in to the same stuff that they've always been given into. And it's no different today. If we're going to be believers in Christ and we're going to walk as people who profess the name of Christ, then there needs to be an expectation about the type of power that we're supposed to walk within every day. There needs to be an expectation about the, the ways of which we're supposed to win and we're supposed to give God glory regardless of the situation that's going on in our life. We're supposed to live with this type of power within us. You know, I, I use Amy's exam, uh, circumstance as an example. And, and like I said earlier, many of you have been there before. I've been there. I know what it is to, to be uh, with your parent and, and, and offering up care in a very, very hard time when the outlook is bleak and they're not giving a whole lot of hope and, and you're not, not sure what's going to happen, this, that, and the other. And, and, and I, I think it's perfectly fine. In those situations, you can be sad and you can have a heavy heart and you can be drawn to tears at times, but it doesn't mean you have to lose just because you're in that situation. 
It doesn't mean you give up hope. It doesn't mean that you lose your peace. It doesn't mean that you lose your joy in Christ. It doesn't mean that you give up everything that God has blessed you with through His Son just because the circumstance is hard. And this is what we watch happen in people's lives. This is living a powerless life. It's when you allow the circumstances of life to dictate and determine who you are today. Who you are. You're going to be joyful today because everything went smooth. You know, or, or you're going to be at your wit's end because everything's, everything's coming undone. Your employment situation is changing, so you're mad at everybody around you because of the stress that it adds. Or this has happened, relationships have changed, and because relationships have changed, your whole world's been turned upside down. Well, because of a bad doctor's report, now you're fearful and you slip off into a deep, dark place or whatever. You're allowing circumstances to dictate and determine who you are. Well, the power of Christ that lives within us is supposed to enable us and empower us to not allow circumstances to determine who we are in this world. Can we be sad at times? Yes. Will we be disappointed at times? Absolutely. Will we, uh, you know, feel bad about whatever situation or circumstance is going on in our life? There's no doubt about it. But it doesn't mean that we have to lose in those situations. It doesn't mean that we lose sight of our Savior. And it doesn't, it certainly doesn't mean that we change our identity. Our identity is still in Christ, regardless of what circumstances are coming undone around us. You know, Paul and Silas are, are, are great examples. They end up in the innermost parts of the prison for sharing the gospel. And while they're in the innermost parts of the prison, around midnight, in some of the darkest, coldest, hardest places that a person could be with their future, with, with uncertainty of their future, they did not sit there with their head down, moaning and groaning because God has allowed this to happen to them. They did not sit down there and, and, and throw their hands up and quit and decide that it's not worth it. They didn't sit down there and wish that they were somewhere else because of their hard situation. The Bible says that one prayed and one was singing psalms. And because of that, that the earth shook. And of course, we know freedom come. But in the midst of all of those prisoners, they did not allow their circumstance to define them. Their identity was still in Christ, regardless of what this world, the situation this world puts them in. And let me tell you, that's victory. As much as anything else, that's victory. Show me a believer who's, who's, who's anchored in Christ and, and there's hard things that's going on in their life and they still have joy in Christ. That's victory there. Show me a believer who's maybe gotten a bad doctor's report or uh, their finances are coming undone or their family's pushing them to the brink or whatever it might be. Show me one of them and they still have joy in Christ and they still have peace in God. That's victory. That's victory. What we don't need, and we got way too much of, it determines which way the wind's blowing. In some people, if they're going to be joyful today or if they're going to be angry today. It just, it just determines what situation's going on in their life. You're a, you've become a prisoner to things that you've been set free from when that's the case. So let me go on to the next passage. Listen to the way this reads. This is Philippians 4 and 6. We're going to read all the way through 13. It says, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. It says, And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Now listen to this. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue, if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. Now, b before I go on, I want you to listen to this. Now, I, I think that one of the things that Paul does is he gives them instructions on how to live this life in a, in, in a manner of victory. How, how do you carry yourself? How do you present yourself to the world around you as one who has victory in Jesus when all this tough stuff, difficult stuff's going on in your life. Well, one of the ways in which you do it is, uh, is that you set your mind on good things. You set your mind on pure things. You set your mind on lovely things, on, on godly things. You put your mind there. And when you do that, it helps you get to a place of where you can live your life in victory because the world needs to see you living your life in victory because you claim to be Christ. 
They don't need to see because, listen, I'm a believer and, and I've accepted Jesus and I go to church. And then they watch you fall apart every time a storm comes. Then they watch you turn around every time there's a, there's a, there's a financial hiccup. They watch you come to pieces when the world gets hard. The, the world around us, they need to see steadfast victors in Christ. Let me tell you what they're not going to see. Is they're not going to see perfect lives. I know that. They're not going to. They're not going to see perfect situations. They're not going to watch that happen. This past Wednesday, before Amy got back, she got back a little afternoon, and I'd come down with strep throat. And anyways, I had fever. I got up that morning with an old fever, and I was getting the kids ready. And, uh, you know, we were trying to get breakfast done and get lunch boxes packed, and we was going through all this. And, you know, it was just going to be one, you could tell it was going to be one of those days. You know, things were just, it was just rough. You didn't feel good. And, uh, we had earring problems. Couldn't get an earring in. Isn't that right, Ruthie? I poked and prodded. I could get it in backwards. <laughs> but I couldn't get it going the right way. Had an earring problem. and So and in the middle of all of that, Luke runs to the garbage can and throws up. And uh, and then through the house throwing up. And so I, all this, you, you, I don't know if my response was very pastorly <laughs> during those moments of uh, despair and anguish and while cleaning up puke Ugh. you know I, it just, I don't know if you would have looked at me and said boy that's a textbook right there that's how you handle it right there you, you look at you know by through Psalms and the way David writes that's exactly the way I, you're not going to watch perfect lives unfold. You're going to see people with problems. You're going to see people with headaches and heartaches and disappointments. You're going to watch people who should do stuff one way and, 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 and they just refuse to do it for whatever reason. You're going to watch trouble unfold in their life. And the reason is, is because we live in a broken world and we live in this broken flesh and we're in this sanctifying process. And it's a, it's a long journey. It's a, it's a long, difficult journey along the way. But... We don't have to lose just because it's getting hard. You know, we, we don't have to lose just because the morning's tough or we don't feel good or we've got bad news. We can still have victory in Christ. And the world needs to see not perfect lives. The world needs to see people who has victory in Christ today. That's what they need to see more than anything else. They need to... They need to see how do you respond when this happens at work? How do you respond when this is going on with your family? What do you do? They need to see people who have victory in Jesus, and that only comes from the power of the Spirit that lives within us. Let me finish this passage. It says, The things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do, and the God of peace will be with you. He says, But I rejoice in the Lord greatly now that now at last your care for me has flourished again, uh, though you surely did care, but you lacked opportunity. Now listen to this. And if there's ever a, a passage y'all need to learn, it's, it's not just verse 13, but it's the context of this. It says, Not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned whatever state I am to be content. I know how to be abased. I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things, I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. And this is where he says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Let me tell you, he's not talking about worldly success in this manner. He's not talking about conquering worldly goals when he mentions 13. Paul is saying, through Christ, whatever situation that I find myself in, that I can have victory in that situation through Christ. If I'm hungry, if I'm abounding, if I'm abased, if things are going well... Or if things are going bad, I have learned to be content in that state. And Paul says that clearly comes from a power that we only get through Christ. In other words, he doesn't let the circumstances of life determine if he's going to be a victory 
uh, if he's going to have victory or if he's going to have failure. It's all about Christ that lives within. Let me read the next one to you real quick. First John 4 and 4, and, and I think this is what we're saying and as, uh, as much as anything. It says, you are of God, little children, and you have overcome them because he who, is, uh, he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. And that's what the world needs to see. The world needs to show you the power that lives within you, not the failure that lives on the outside of us. They, they need to see the power that lives through the Spirit inside of us and not just the brokenness of this flesh day in and day out. And let me tell you, I don't care what, how you frame it, according to this next passage that we're going to read, that the power of Christ and the power of the Spirit that lives within is greater than anything you'll face on this earth. And here's how Romans re- uh, explains it. Let me read Romans, uh, Romans 8 and 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall it be tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are killed all day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. It says, for I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor height nor depth nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. You know, and you can hear Paul saying that the one that lives within me is greater than anything I want to face outside of me. And there is nothing on this earth that can overcome the power of the Spirit that lives within my heart and within my life. Let me say this before we uh, dis- or take a time of prayer this morning. There are a lot of people who claim to be Christian who are walking through life uh, I guess the best way to describe it, in a less than victor mentality. They, they, they are walking through life, head down, defeated posture, constantly expecting the worst day in and day out. I believe that the Spirit of God that lives within us is pulling us away from that. It's pulling us away, pulling us to a place of where we can walk in victory. Now, I don't, I don't think for a moment that it means uh, financially everything's going to be just right. Physically, all your doctor's reports are going to be just right. And I, don't, I don't believe that's the case at all. What I do believe is that regardless of whatever storm comes, we can let the world see the power of Christ within us. And we can be victors in those situations. So this morning... I know that, as we've said many times before, everybody's got something, got stuff going on from heavy stuff that they don't want to deal with to disappointments that's raging in their life to when they look at themselves, they do not like what they see. Whatever it is, everybody's dealing with something in one capacity or another. And so many of these things that we deal with are so much bigger than us. They're bigger than us. So in order to have victory in the face of this adversity, we have to fully depend upon the Spirit of God for that victory. He has given us victory over sin. He has given us victory over death. He has given us victory over hell and the grave. And I don't think for a moment He gave us victory over all of that so we could walk this life in defeat. I think we're supposed to walk with our head up and we're supposed to be victors in Christ. Paul says... That through him, we are more than conquerors through Christ. And the world around us, around us needs to see that. They need to see that. In Paul's case, if they end up in the innermost parts of the prison, or if they're in a constant state of abounding, they need to see that they are victors in Christ. And that needs to be the same for us today. It is not what we, uh, worldly things that we have in common that joins us together as brothers and sisters. It's not because we've been born in the same place. We've been raised a lot alike. We've all got the same likes or dislikes. What unites us together as brothers and sisters is the fact that we have put our faith in Christ and in Him, we are victors together. That's what joins us together. We need to carry ourselves like that and we need to let the world around us see that. Jan, if you want to come to the piano for me this morning. We're going to give you an opportunity to pray before we take time for communion this morning. Whatever's going on in your life, whatever you'd like to deal with, whatever battle that you're struggling, you need victory in, 
There is a remarkable power within uh, that only comes from Christ. And the best way to tap into it is through prayer. So this morning, I, I want to invite you to come pray. If there's something going on in your life you'd like to lift up, now's a wonderful time to do it. If you'll stand to your feet, let me have a word of prayer, and then we'll invite you. Father, we thank you for this time together and for the opportunity that we have today. We thank you for loving us. Father, we thank you for the victory that we do have in Christ. And God, this morning, you know what's going on in the lives of the people that are here today. And God, I pray this morning that we don't hold back and that we don't hesitate. But Lord, that we just lay it down at your feet this morning. In Christ's name, amen. As Jan plays, I invite you to come pray this morning.